Just raise your hand if you can hear me, just so I'm sure. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. So um, today, our class is sponsored anonymous, anonymously in the Rifwa Shelema of Ezra Ben Salcha and Avram Yosef, uh, Avram Ben Yosef Vebatya. I uh, let's hope that they and anybody who is in need of any type of recovery, physical and spiritual, which is what we're going to be discussing today, um, will be uh, cured, healed, and strengthened. Um, also, one more public announcement. Uh, my friend and rabbi, uh, Rabbi Nathan Dweck, has a 1 p.m. class today. For those who are interested, his Zoom code is his name, Rabbi Nathan Dweck, and Dweck is spelled D-W-E-C-K. That's at 1 o'clock today. So let's get straight into the parasha. There is a lot going on this week. Um, it seems that just as we um, finish one drama, we enter another one. It's really, really um, a lot to digest in one week. So we're going to first have an overview, and then we're going to zoom into a couple of areas uh, that are pertinent, hopefully, to all of us and to me personally. So we start Parashat Chukat with the Para Aduma. The para aduma is the red heifer. We're going to speak of that in a little bit more detail in a bit. So I'm just going to touch on it for now. It's followed by the death of Miriam. Moshe's sister dies in this perasha. And as soon as she dies, the commentaries make a very close uh, relation, correlation between her death and the complaint that the people have for water which leads us into the story of Moshe hitting the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Also in this perasha, we uh, encounter Edom, we come to their borders. Edom is the, uh, are the descendants of Esav, Adomi Kulo Ke Aderet Se'ad, he's the Edom nation. We ask for passage, we say we'll pay for anything we utilize, and of course, I shouldn't say of course, but I should say, unfortunately, we are refused uh, entry. They say, no way, you cannot enter our land. If we have a chance, we'll talk about that. Moving forward, Ahadon also dies in this week's Perasha. So we lose two major luminaries, Miriam and Ahadon, this week. Um, that's followed by a, an attack. Um, by the Kena'anim, which the commentaries believe are specifically Amalek. And I'll start to paint a picture for you uh, in about a minute. I just want to continue the overview. The people again complain, this time it's for food, and God sends them these fiery serpents. Um, that's also an entire drama in and of itself. It's followed by a song that the people sing, and we end the perasha with conquering uh, Sichon, the king of Emori, and the famous Og Melech Habashan. I wanted to give you this overview because it doesn't expressly say it in this week's perasha, but most commentaries agree that this is the turning point in the desert where we are now in the 40th year. The 38 years that um, we had to um, dwell in the desert because of the sin of the spies are now over. And this generation and this drama that's taking place is all with the new generation. It's important for us to understand these are the people that are going to go into the land of Israel. And so we see a lot of similarities that we had coming out of the land of Egypt, we're going to actually encounter them going into the land of Israel. Um, Rabbi Yoni Grossman writes a beautiful piece where he actually does a chiastic structure of the events from Egypt to Sinai and how they mirror the events from Sinai to Israel. 
there is song in both places, there's Amalek in both places, there are complaints for water in both places. And he does a very uh, methodical job of showing how those complaints line up with each other. Um, and that's also very telling because whether we are going away from something or moving towards something else, there are going to be certain challenges. So for today, I'd like to start with the Pada Aduma because I think there is, I'll, I'll say this, it may on the surface seem like an outdated, um, irrelevant law for our time. King Solomon writes about the Pada Aduma that he can't even understand. Maybe only Moshe Rabbeinu was the one to be able to understand what's the meaning behind this red heifer. Why a red heifer? Why is this law here? How does it work? What are the mechanics of sprinkling water on a person who's come in contact with death? It's a very, it's not just cryptic, the whole premise of it is very hard to understand. So let's look at it together and see if maybe if we take it in a totality and in context with what the other elements that are taking place in our perasha, maybe we can walk away with some relevance for our lives today. So Parashat Hukat is chapter 19 in the book of Bemidbar. If you're working with your blue books, it's page 838. I wanna start just by introducing ourselves to the Para Aduma, this red heifer, and just for the um, technicalities of it, the red heifer had to be a cow that had only red hair, if it had one red, one hair that wasn't red, it was still okay, but two or more, it was disqualified. Um, the belief is that there have only been nine red heifers since the beginning of time, and that the 10th red heifer is going to herald in the coming of Mashiach. So all of these ideas surround this para aduma. I'd like to take some of them and make them a little bit more pertinent to our lives. And let's see how we can do that by reading the Pesukim. So Hashem speaks to Moshe and to Aaron, and he says, this is the chukah of the Torah. That's a pretty big drum roll for what's about to take place. Chukim, a chok, is something that is a uh, law that we don't necessarily understand the practical application or the uh, um, rationale behind it. So of all the laws, of all the chukim, I should say, in the Torah, this particular one, Zot Chukat HaTorah, that's a very big introduction, Asher Tziva Hashem Lemor, that God has commanded to say, speak to Bnei Yisrael, and they should take for you a para aduma temima, a perfectly red heifer, asher ein ba mum, that does not have any type of a blemish, asher lo ala aleha ol, that never had any type of yoke placed upon it. And you bring it to Elazar HaKohen, he's going to bring it outside the machane, he's going to uh, slaughter it. And then what happens is Elazad is going to take from its blood with its fingers and he's going to sprinkle it on the, um, by Ohel Moed seven times. And then we get to the uh, process by which we're going to utilize this para. The para itself is going to get burnt right before his eyes in its entirety, its skin, its flesh, its blood, all of that is going to become burnt. Then we have another added piece. The Kohen is going to take of the woods, we've encountered these before, the Erez, which is the smallest uh, hyssop, we call it Zatar. So the hyssop and the Ezov, um, we're going, I'm sorry, the Erez is Arzea Lebanon, I'm sorry, the Erez is the Lebanon, the, the cedar tree, the highest, tallest tree, and the Ezov is the smallest tree, and we're also going to take the um, crimson uh, from the Tola'at, from the worm, and we're going to put it inside this 
uh, bonfire, so to speak, that we're making with the para aduma. So the para is getting burnt up together with the cedar, the hyssop, which is tied together with the red string. And then what happens next is the Kohen is going to immerse and wash his flesh, his clothing in water, and then he can come to the Machaneh, and the Kohen is going to become um, unclean until the evening. And this is one of the questions, one of the riddles that they have in a Tanakh contest, for instance, and the riddle goes something like, you know, what makes the person that's impure pure and makes the person that's pure impure? And the answer is the waters of a para aduma. And let's talk about the application of these waters. So the person who had burnt this heifer is, needs to be washed, and he's going to become, we had said, impure until the evening. But what is going to happen? The person that's going to take its ashes and uh, bring them to a holy place that everybody involved in this story is going to have a role to play. And it's very, very interesting to see, just so we know what's going to happen. And we don't spend all our time here. On the third day and on the seventh day, the Nogeya Bamit, which is in verse 11, the one who comes in contact with death, he is going to be impure for seven days. In order for him to become once again, purified on the third day and on the seventh day, he's going to need to be sprinkled with this mixture, with this concoction. So what is this concoction? What is this mixture? Uh, the waters, there's something called mayim chayim, living waters, rain water, uh, like mikveh water, living waters, but the terminology to use the word mayim chayim, living waters, is used here to express that even when we're talking about something like uh, being contaminated by this idea of death, and we have to talk about that, maybe we should put that on the table right now, uh, halachically speaking, a person who comes in contact with death, meaning either a dead body is in the same building, uh, touches something that has death attached to it, they become contaminated. Now, this contamination may not be something that you could quantify uh, in a lab or take a test or swab yourself for it, but the Torah is saying there is a contamination that you get when you come in contact with a corpse or with any form of death. And it's something that today is, and I mean, it's relevant for all time. The fact that it's a hook, the fact that we can't understand it, doesn't mean that it didn't have relevance then, or more importantly, today we don't have the waters of a para aduma, but the Torah wants us to understand that the concept still exists. So let's talk about this concept a little bit first, and let's see what is it what what does the Torah want to uh, um, express to us when it explains this process? That in order to become pure, you need to be sprinkled with these living waters that are mixed together with the ashes of the para aduma, and within those ashes, what got burnt together with those ashes was the hyssop, the cedar, and the crimson. All of those are elements for us to start to unpack um, what's being said here. So let's, let's go slowly. So for instance, when we talk about a, a person who comes in contact with death, let's speak this, on the psychological component of it because what's taking place here is going to be a psychological cure. It's going to take seven days this person, I mean, we could think about the shiva, that a person sits for seven days, that might have an implication. In order for us to come to a place of health and of healing and of balance, we need to undergo a process. And the Torah is very sensitive to say that just seeing or 
imagining our own mortality is going to have an effect on us. And so it uses these symbols like living waters, ashes we would normally think represent death, represent ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We hear the word afar, afar va'efed, we're going to return to dust. We think of ashes and dust as being the finality of something. But the Torah wants to mix together this idea of the finality of life or the finality of death, actually, together with living waters. One doesn't exist without the other. They're all they're part and parcel one of the other. And the idea of the smallest plant, the hyssop, and the tallest cedars tied together with a crimson, tied together with this blood uh, colored thread starts to tell us that everybody, you know, there's nothing more certain than death and taxes. Death is a part of life. And that's the first layer I think that maybe is being uh, demonstrated here. And the person who comes in contact has to recognize that death is a part of life. It's not something that's outside of the realm of the norm. It is part of nature and it is a natural course. And just like you can't have life without death, the two are commingled like this mixture. Maybe there's something in the message that there's also no such thing as death without an afterlife. This might be, this look, when I use the word afterlife, uh, everybody has a different notion or a different uh, relationship to that idea, but the soul is still alive. And that the Torah has been clear, whether we heard from Korach's voices or we heard from Hevel's voices, there is a component of the human being that lives on even after the body is expired. So this is like a little bit of a start to the sensitivity that Parashat Hukat has, not for the person who passed, but the person who witnessed this. And a person who witnesses death could easily fall into a depression. And a depression means what's life about? What am I doing here anyway? These questions are normal questions for people to ask and the Torah wants to address those questions. And what sometimes happens, unfortunately, when we're so close, this is not for the person who just read about it in the newspaper, they're so close that they saw it or they felt it, they were in close enough proximity for it to affect them. What happens is sometimes this, experience could cause a person, unfortunately, to become, when I say depressed, I mean in the sense that we become a little bit inactive. We lose our energy. We don't have the force to pick ourselves up. We start to think along the Hevel, Havalim, Hakol Havel, what's it all worth anyway? These are very, very debilitating according to the Torah, According to Parashat Chukat, Parashat Chukat is saying the person who experiences this is in a very dangerous place of having their own implied death. What does that mean, their own implied death? Even though they're the ones that are still alive, they feel that a part of them has died. They feel that they lost their oomph, their uwe, their will, their energy, their, um, their strength. There's a loss of strength that uh, happens with this, um, with this experience. And according to the Torah, and I think this is a very beautiful uh, uh, piece, they believe that this could be contagious. The way the person who witnessed somebody else passing was affected, their reaction can become contagious. And what do I mean by that? There's this contamination that, I'm going to use a strange word, that when we experience these emotions that we are uh, completely overcome by having witnessed the finality of life, 
we sometimes experience a psychological death. And it's a strange term to use, but I want to be clear about this. When any one of us is going through this psychological death, we're alive, we're healthy, we have a pulse, there's nothing, you can go to the doctor and you'll look 100% uh, healthy, but something like a psychological death uh, can easily, a couple of things can happen. A, it can be contagious, other people can be affected by it, but it could also affect us in a way that we could fall into a full-blown depression. And the Torah wants to avoid that at all costs. We use the word depression, so it sounds like a, a clinical term or something that is only a psychological uh, um, malady that requires a, a therapy but the Torah is much, much more uh, sensitive about understanding that this condition, and I'll give you one example because I may be talking too much in, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not being specific. So I, I will tell you the fact that the Kohen, who's going to come and cure the person who's undergoing these emotions and is in this state of a depression, the fact that he himself becomes impure shows us that the Kohen must have a certain amount of empathy, has to literally experience the pain, the suffering, the uh, psychological journey that the tame lamet, that the person that is being sprinkled is undergoing. This is, this is Torah at its most generous. It's saying uh, only a Kohen, by the way, is able to do the sprinkling. So the Kohen already has to be sensitive. The Kohen already has to be a person who is in a position of uplifting the spirit of somebody else. And in order for him to feel the pain of these people who are undergoing this situation, he himself has to become impure. He has to, I, I believe the word is empathy. He has to go through a process of uh, empathy because if a person goes through, just to add one more piece, a person who is seriously in a state of depression, they could develop an apathy for life. This idea where I don't, I'm not interested in anything, nothing is important to me, I don't really care about anything. This emotion takes away the desire to live a vibrant life. And the Torah is all about life. The Torah is all about, when I say vibrant and vibrancy, I mean having a will to do good, to be good, to be involved in the community, to grow, to learn, to strive, to succeed. All of these things are what the Torah really mandates, but it recognizes that there are times in our lives where we're going to fall short of that uh, um, will, I'll say. You hear people using the words, if they're depressed, I don't have the will to live. I don't have the desire. I don't have the strength or the energy. And so this kind of situation, according to Parashat Kukat, it demands immediate attention. The Torah is saying from day one, from the first minute, from the first second that these thoughts even take root or these feelings even take root inside of a person, treatment must be administered immediately. We cannot allow, I'm gonna use the term the patient, the patient is the one who's undergoing these emotions, we cannot allow the patient to have time for these emotions to run unchecked and uncontrolled because it's a very, it's contagious, forget to everybody else, it's contagious to the person themselves. What does that mean? It means that it might start in the mind and then it goes to the heart and then it runs rampant until every cell in the person's body is affected by this feeling. And the Torah, which before any medicine, and it's the most, it's modern 
and antiquated all in one. It has, anybody who's going to study psychology needs to come and read Parashat Chukat because it's really going deep into the soul of a person and it understands the course that something like depression will take. And it's something that can happen very, the deterioration, the, the spread of, I'm gonna call it a dis-ease, because it is, it's a disease, but it's a dis-ease. And this spread of this dis-ease is something that is, uh, catches on and, and, and just can spark out of control. And so what is the Torah's antidote for this? So a person now gets into this, it's worse than a funk, so I don't want to just call it that, gets into this place of, of uh, unhappiness and, and, and dissatisfaction is, is calling it too lightly, uh, gets into this place of unhappiness or God forbid loses the will to live. And we'll notice that the Kohen has to come on the third day and on the seventh day. It's not just about sprinkling him with the actual waters. It is. The waters do have their own innate ability to bring healing. But by the Kohen coming to visit this person, and we know it from ourselves, if you know of anybody who's undergoing any kind of uh, uh, depression or any kind of pain, these persons, these people need to be checked on regularly because it's very easy and very quick, says the Torah, to go from a place of feeling that somebody else had a trauma and somebody else's life was gone to somehow turning that inward. That was an outward emotion. That was something outside of me. External to me was somebody else's soul departing. And what we do very often is we take external circumstances and we internalize them. And then all of a sudden, we start to think about our own mortality. And when we start to think about our own mortality, it puts us in a very uh, uh, um, uncomfortable state. And sometimes the state that it puts us in is so uncomfortable. And this is the Torah speaking in a very clear, that's why we don't leave people alone when they are very, very, uh, um, aggrieved when they are in a in a bad way you, you can't we we there's a term they, they could become god forbid suicidal so the the waters of the para aduma these living waters are intended literally to sprinkle life back into the person who's losing their spirit in some kind of way so it doesn't want to underestimate or undermine the emotional health, the psychological health of people, which, which really is a beautiful uh, thing that the Torah is introducing to us. And so after we learn about this understanding that human beings are delicate creatures, we easily can internalize an event in our lives and that event from one minute to the next could extinguish a light that we had inside of us. It could put us in a very uh, a dangerous place. And from this para uh, aduma introduction, from this start, I believe that the Torah is giving us the cure before we get literally into the death of Miriam. And I think it's beautiful because we often say that the Torah brings the cure before it brings the, the illness. So the cure is already here. The first of our three, I'm going to call them luminaries, the luminaries that brought us through the desert were Miriam, Aharon, and Moshe. And according to the commentaries, wherever Miriam was, as long as she was with us in the desert, we merited, because of her uh, greatness, we merited to have a special well, Be'er, a special well that traveled with us in the desert. And they say that Aharon, because of him, we had the Ananeha Kavod, these beautiful clouds that protected us at all times. The Anan, you could remember, would be synonymous with Aharon. The Ananeha Kavod were always connected to the Mishkan, which was the uh, area of service of Aharon. 
And then Moshe, they say, because of him, we merited the man. We merited a sustenance that came from the heaven, but was actually intended to sustain us physically. And the man we always know is synonymous with Torah, with the word of God. If we ingest the word of God, if we are able to process the laws of the Torah, it will sustain us not just physically, but spiritually as well. So these, out of the three, in this week's parasha, we're going to learn about Miriam's passing. And the way the Torah describes her passing in chapter 20 of B'midbar, it says, B'nai Israel, Vayavu B'nai Israel, Kol Ha'eda, the entire uh, congregation, they come to Midbar Sin on the first month, and they stay in Kadesh, and Miriam dies there, and Miriam is buried there. So I'd like to say that this is the pasuk that the um, commentaries use to say that this first month is the first month of the last year. Usually it says the first month of the second year, the first month of, it'll quantify what year it is. But whenever the Torah doesn't quantify the year and just gives the month, it means it's either the first month or the last month. I mean, excuse me, it's either the first year or the last year. And since we know it's not the first year, they say that this is the last year and they add to it the understanding from the words kol ha'eda. These people, this group, this kol ha'eda, all of these witnesses, we know an eda is a group that has witnessed. This group is the group that has witnessed what took place in the desert but they're kol, they are an entirety, meaning that this entirety of people signifies the entirety that's going to enter the land. And these, which would also signify that the people who were not gonna enter the land have now all passed on. So again, if we wanna look at the red heifer, at the idea of the passings and the deaths and all the people that we buried in the sand for 38 years that we were in the desert, the red heifer would come to say, there is a life after that. Even after this entire generation died, there will be born, there will come from here a new generation. There will be born, you know, from the ashes. We, we often talk about the uh, um, tragedies in the Holocaust and, and very often it's said from, the, from those ashes then came the state of Israel, the land of Israel, a new rebirth for the people. And so maybe this is the way of the Torah saying, yes, from the deaths of those that came before, those are going to sprinkle life into this future congregation. And this congregation here is called an Eda, and they come to Midbar Sin on the first month, uh, we believe, of the last year. And when it says that Miriam had died, excuse me, had died there, we are already prepared for the idea of if the well was there because of her, then um, there's going to be a problem with water. So she dies there, she's buried there. It doesn't go into deep detail about her burial as it does go into detail with Aharon. Um, it says, Velo haya mayim la So there was no water for the Eda. And what's the first thing they do is they congregate. Whenever I told you, whenever you see Al Moshe, Ve'al Aharon, it means that they are not just a peaceful gathering, they are more of a mob, they are more in the f uh, frame of mind, uh, like protesters that are coming to uh, proclaim their dissatisfaction with what's going on. And the next verse sort of supports that, Vayarev Ha'ami Moshe, and now they fight with Moshe and they tell him um, in verse 3, Velugavatnu begeva achenu lifne Hashem. We wish we would have expired the way our brothers expired. So these are people that are wrought with thirst and they're so thirsty that they wish 
that they had died. They'd rather be dead than have to go through this uh, emotion. Why did you bring us to this Midbar to die here? Us and our livestock. Why did you bring us out of Mitzrayim anyway to this Hamakom Harahazit, to this terrible place? By the way, this is not a place that has Te'ina, Gefen, and Rimon. It doesn't have those fruits, which by the way, these specific fruits, the fig, the grape, and the pomegranate, what are those? If we hear those fruits being mentioned, we know right away that those are the fruits that the spies had brought back. So you showed us the fruits, you gave us a sneak preview of what's in the land, but the truth is it's been 38 years later, we haven't seen a single fig, a single grape, or a single pomegranate, and on top of it, there's no water to drink. So Moshe and Aharon, their reaction is they go to Petach Ohel Moed, to the opening of the tent of meeting, and they fall on their faces, and right away what appears? The presence of God. And this is something that we have to pay close attention to. What's going to take place in the next few verses is not just going to be life-changing for Moshe, but is going to be, I think, one of the most important laws that we could imagine in Torah. And I'll explain. Vaidaber Hashem el Moshe lemor. Hashem speaks to Moshe and he says, Kach et hamate. Take the rod. The mate is that uh, stick. We, we know of Moshe's stick because it had been used in history before. He had used his stick uh, to split the waters of the seas. He had used his stick to bring about a lot of the makot. So take your stick. So already when he, we hear these words, take your stick, the first thing that we might think of is the first place that Moshe's stick is even used, which is when he's on the mountain with the burning bush and he says the people are not going to believe me hashem says take your stick and throw it on the ground so automatically we know that this is part of moshe's mission from the very beginning let me remind you what your stick has done i want you to take your stick with you and gather the eda God doesn't call them an am. So already, in a crazy way, before we move any further, God doesn't seem to be upset with the complaint of the people. This is a very important piece to the story. What happens here is, and for all of us, is we start to get a sense of a deja vu. We start to get a sense of complaining for water. This is not the first time that people complain for water. They had complaints for water in the past. If you'll remember, we'll take a look together. If you'll remember in, uh, where is that? Where did I put that? You will remember, hold on one second. I don't know why I lost my place, but here we go. In May, on page 380, which is chapter 15 in Shemot, they, in verse 23, they come to Mara, they can't drink water from Mara because either they or the waters are bitter, and the name of the place is called Mara. And what happens there? They complain on Moshe and they say, what should we drink? And Moshe or the nation screams out to God. They throw in a tree and they sweeten the waters. And that's where God gives them a chok and a mishpat. And he teaches them his laws. In other words, the same story-ish where the people want water, they complain about the lack of water. Either they themselves were bitter, so anything they drank was bitter. That's what happened in the story where they're leaving Egypt, coming towards Sinai. But now in our story, going from Sinai to Eretz Israel, God seems to think that their request for water is legitimate. And we're going to see it because God doesn't get angry at them. 
All he does is he tells Moshe and Aharon. He says, go to the Ada, go to these people who have witnessed my greatness, as, a pers- as opposed to saying, go to the Am, which would make them a nation that is uh, much less, on a much lower level. Atave Aaron, you and Aaron, your brother. Vedibartem el hasela. This is the big issue where God says, I want you to speak to the rock. Vehishkita etaita. And I'm sorry, you're going to speak to the Sela in front of their eyes, and it'll give of its water. And you'll take out water for them from the rock and you will allow the people and their livestock to all drink. And there's so much written about these few lines. The first question is, why does Moshe need to take his staff with him, if his staff in the form of a stick, I mean, uh, his rod, why does he need to take it with him if he's only going to speak to the rock? That's a very big question that the question that the commentaries ask. Um, and as we move forward, we're going to see more questions emerge when we see the reaction of Moshe. So Moshe takes the mater, and now we have these words, milifne Hashem, the rod that was in front of God. And the question is, is it the same rod? Was it his rod that he used to do those miracles in Egypt that had turned into a snake when God was giving him all his simanim? Or is the stick that's in front of God the one that was Aharon's staff that had turned into almonds that had blossomed that was left for posterity in the Ohel Moed as a symbol of Aharon's leadership? We don't know if there are two rods at play here or just one. But they vayakhilu Moshe ve'aron. Moshe and Aaron congregate the entire kahal, the congregation. So they're an eda and they're a kahal, which is still an upstanding group of people. They bring them to the face of the sala, the face of the stone, and all of a sudden, vayomer lahem. It's only one person speaking. And we believe that the person that is speaking here is Moshe, and he says these words, Shimuna Hamorim. Listen, you, either rebellious, like Mored, or from the word Mar, you bitter ones, like Me Meriva, where they fought because the Mayim were Marim. Listen, you bitter or rebellious ones. Hamin hasela hazed. Do you expect that from this rock, notzi lachem mayim, we will bring water out for you? I'll finish the next verse and then we'll talk about it. And so Moshe, he picks up his hand, he hits the rock with his own staff. It seems bematehu is with his own personal staff. He doesn't hit it once, but twice, water comes out and the people and their livestock are able to drink. And we are left, we may not be left stunned. We may think that, of course, since he had his staff, it was meant to use to hit and we left out that little word about speaking to the rock. The issue is that sometimes we approach text with our preconceived notions. So since we know what's going to happen in the next verse, we already made the judgment in the previous verse. But at the end of verse 11, water does come out of the rock and the people do drink. So you want to say to yourself, hasov tov, hakol tov, all's well that ends well. The water worked, God produced, Everybody, shalom al Yisrael, go about your business and have a nice day. We can't say that because the next verse, verse 12 says, Hashem tells Moshe and Aharon, Ya'an lo he'emantem bi, because you didn't either believe or trust or have faith. We could talk about that word, emuna, even like an omenet, which is a nurse, which is somebody who supports, who's supportive, and nourishing, because you didn't support 
nourish my existence, show faith or belief, lehakdisheni le'enei b'nei Israel to sanctify me in the eyes of b'nei Israel. Therefore, you will not bring these people into the land that I gave to them. And these waters are called waters of Meriva. The name of this place is going to be called now May Meriva because B'nai Yisrael fought Asheravu B'nai Yisrael Tashem because B'nai Yisrael ended up fighting with God Vaikadesh Bam and he was sanctified through them. I don't know about you, but this is very hard to make sense of. How are they sanctified through God if God just said that Moshe gave up the opportunity to uh, have his name sanctified? So I want to talk about this whole thing altogether and ask ourselves, what's at the root of this problem? And the reason I say that is because if we understand that Moshe, we're not here, let's just say one thing, we're not here to analyze Moshe. This is not a psychotherapy on Moshe Rabbeinu and what caused him to get so angry, what caused him to use words, shim una hamorim, what caused him to deviate from the plan that God had established, speak to the rock, but instead he hit the rock. And again, if this was all an innocent mistake, which we would have loved for it to be, but clearly it's not because God comes and he is going to mete out a punishment for Moshe and Aharon because of this scenario. And again, what was it exactly that they did wrong? Was it that Moshe hit the rock instead of speaking to it? Was it that he hit it twice instead of once? Was it that he lost his temper with the people? What was it exactly that God was upset about? And the Torah is very vague. The Torah just says, Ya'an lo bi, because you didn't trust me, or you didn't believe in me, or you didn't have faith in me, or from these words, from the word amen, and um, the word amen is an acronym. It's an acronym for El Melech Ne'eman. It's also an acronym, if we take the first place those letters appear, the Aleph, the Mem, and the Nun, they would spell Elohim Merachefet Benafshi. So when you were acting, my spirit, says God, was not prevalent. It was not in the forefront of your actions. This is God telling Moshe. This is not our assessment. God is just telling Moshe, because you didn't have this thing, Emuna, within me, and because you didn't, it's often explained, take this opportunity to glorify my name in, before B'nai Israel. you're not the ones that are going to bring B'nai Israel into the land. How the punishment fits the crime, I think we should start with that. How does not bringing the people in the land, how does that become the punishment for not having uh, uh, given the people an opportunity to see God's greatness? So we have to start with that. And the truth of the matter is that these people, this generation that we are now identifying as the generation that's going to go into the land of Israel, this generation of people is not the generation that left Egypt. And therefore, God says, you can't treat everybody with one same uh, uh, approach. Meaning, what may have been okay for the generation that left Egypt is not okay for the generation that's going into Eretz Israel. They are totally different uh, people. They learn differently. They, they uh, um, perceive things differently. We didn't let that first generation come in, so we can't treat this generation the way we treated them because then this generation's not gonna make it either. This new generation has to have uh, certain um, experiences and a certain education that they're going to need to carry with them into the new land. And this here right now was an opportunity for you 
to express or exemplify something for them. So what was it that God wanted for these people to see? The first thing clearly it seems, and again, there are many commentaries and a lot written up about this. I'm just sharing a few ideas with you. And the first idea is that if you speak to a rock, it's much more effective it's a much greater miracle. It has a greater wow factor that you spoke to a rock and water came out just by the power of speech. That in and of itself is going to be the key to Moshe using his speech one way when God wanted to use it, him to use his words, his ish devarim, his spokesman, God's spokesman, Moshe, to use his words to create, to build up, to nourish, to bring water from a rock. That's how God wanted Moshe to use his language. And why was that so important to God that Moshe bring this miracle about through speech? Because God is saying here, by you, this new generation, this new group of people entering Eretz Israel, this is a recreation just like Bereshit was. This is a whole new world that's being created now. A new reality, a new existence, the way the world initially came into existence through words and through speech. This new world, I am now creating something new for you. And if we're going to use our words, they must be used for building, for producing, for nourishing. Moshe, you can't take your, this is not the place, and this is not the time for you to tell the people, Shimuna Hamorim. This is not the people, time to be yelling at the people. This is a time to be teaching the people. And this opportunity is only lost on Moshe, and I, I, God forbid, could never judge Moshe because after everything Moshe has been through, this anger that he's expressing towards the people is an anger that has a very big deja vu attached to it. It's as if he's speaking to the old generation. It's as if he's saying, how many times are we going to go through this? How many times do we have to go through this same scenario where you nag and complain and I have to provide water for you? What was lost on Moshe is that these people that are complaining here and now, this is their first offense. These are not the same people that we encountered earlier in the book of Bimidbar. And so what Moshe, what God is really saying is you're punishing the children for the sins of their fathers. That's not how we're going to start. That's not the blueprint, the foundations that we need to build a nation with. We're building a new nation in their own land. And this building has to come with a certain amount of uh, patience for the people. They are like children, they are like babies, but language that's going to be used to build them up cannot be this type of language. The Zohar says a very scary, scary thing. It says that when a person becomes angry, they actually are lighting the fires of Gehinom. Now, this is a very, it's an imagery and again, Kabbalistically speaking, the image is there for us to say, before I ignite this flame, this fire, this uh, anger that I have inside me, I have to be aware that this uh, um, sentiment that with anger, let, let's use God's anger, for instance. When God gets angry, what follows his anger is a punishment for the people. When we get angry, our first in instinct, we're godly creatures, we're created in the image of God, and so the first thing that happens when we get angry and we feel pain and we are boiling and bubbling inside, we want other people to feel that same pain or that same hurt or that same discomfort. 
And so it, a cycle of wanting to inflict pain is what starts to happen here. And what happens is, unfortunately, is that these fires of anger, once we allow this emotion of anger to get inside of us, it could really start to destroy all the things that are near and dear to us. Um, they use very often, they'll say like on Shabbat, be very careful because when people are under pressure, getting ready for Shabbat and everything that has to happen, that's the time that we are most likely to end up getting, uh, you know, steaming and end up letting those pots boil over, so to speak. You know, they, they use that imagery of the Shabbat pots, let those boil over, but don't let your own anger keep your steam under the lid and things like that. Uh, they'll teach very often, if you're gonna get angry, let it be an external anger, not something internal. Or like we like to say, only get angry from the neck up. Don't allow your inside, don't allow your, your heart uh, to, to permeate or to penetrate all of this pent up anger. And there's a very scary understanding where it, when it comes to anger. And the idea is that, and this is also, I believe, has its roots in the uh, Kabbalistic teachings, that every, um, every feeling, every sentiment is attached to a different limb of the body. But they say that anger doesn't have a specific uh, limb attached to it because anger affects the soul of a person. And when, and for those of us who've ever gotten angry, I, I, I could say this uh, from myself, but we're not the same person we would normally be when we're angry. When we're angry, Kabbalistically speaking, a, our soul, so to speak, departs from us and a different soul enters us. And what happens, and they, the term is a little scary that's used, and they say an unholy soul enters us, so to speak. And now we're not talking anymore about therapy. We're talking about religion religiously speaking, we have to be so careful. And the Torah is coming to tell us this, even Moshe Rabbeinu, and it's comforting to know in a way it humanizes, not just Moshe, but all of us. It humanizes all of us to know that we all have a breaking point. Usually our breaking point comes not from the specific situation like here where they wanted water, which is actually a normal request. It's something that we've heard before. We're in a desert. Of course, people are going to want water. But is Moshe bringing in all the past, all the instances where they drove him crazy and concentrating them here to this one place and this one time? And so what the Torah is trying to tell us is be very, very careful because the minute you allow another soul and unholiness, and why do they use that term, an unholy soul? Is because normally we have godliness within us. Normally we have Elohim merachefet benafshi. Normally we know that we were created in the image of God and we have God permeating, permeating through our souls. But the minute that our calm self leaves and this crazy soul, this crazy self of us takes root, what happens is we don't want to be the body that's associated with that soul. Very often you'll hear that angry people, God forbid, Laleno, end up committing suicide. It's a very scary, dangerous emotion because they don't even want to be with their own selves. And so, look, they compare anger to idol worship because they say that we take leave of our senses and other things control us and we no longer control ourselves. So as far as the perasha is taking us to, it is telling us, be very careful, and it's being very generous to take the humblest, 
man who has withstood so many storms and so many complaints. Imagine two generations worth of people nagging and complaining on him. Moshe Rabbeinu, they, I believe, used his uh, anger to teach us all a lesson to say, don't take this, don't bring your baggage, don't bring all your past uh, aggravations into your new world. Moshe, you can't be the one to bring the people into the new world, not simply because we're punishing you for one misstep or one misdeed. Moshe will always be the greatest human to walk the face of the earth. And I think it's not because he was perfect, it's because he was human. That's what makes him so fantastic. But the Torah at the same time, this is not a punishment for Moshe, more as a, a learning, a teaching tool for us to say, if you want to start a new day, if you want to start a new life, if you want to move forward, if you want to build something new, if you want to create something new, you have to leave the past in the past. And if you're going to carry around all of those things that have driven you crazy or have angered you or aggravated you in the past, you're going to bring them with you and one little thing goes wrong and God forbid, you're going to allow yourself to explode. What the Torah wants is to avoid at all costs uh, compromising our um, balance, our sense of peace also wants to let us know that it's a very difficult and very delicate state. This idea of balance, one little thing could tip the scales. So what we need to do in times of calm is bring in as much light, bring in as much understanding, remind ourselves that if God forbid for one minute, we allow the anger to get the best of us, maybe it helps us to think of the fires of Gehinom that we're igniting. Maybe it helps us to think that it's like Abu Dazara. Maybe these ideas are given to us by the Chachamim so that we would fear our own anger. Because at that moment, once that horse is out of the barn, it's like, like a terrible headache that becomes a migraine. If you don't take those two Tylenols in that first second that you feel that maybe I have a headache, 200 Tylenols are not going to help you later on. And the same is true for our emotions, whether it's anger here in the story of the water with the rock, or whether it's depression, in the story of Hukat, I think a lot of these speak to the humanity, to the human aspect, to say we are human. It isn't easy to stay balanced. It isn't easy to be in control. I don't think the Torah expects us to be even killed all the time, but it's cautioning us in the most serious way possible to say, be super careful because once you allow that anger to take root, the effects and the slope that we could quickly slide down to could be life altering, could be life shattering. And at the same time, I believe it's here to give us a sense of empathy for those around us. And for people who say things at a time of rage, maybe we could say that wasn't them speaking. That was the unholy soul that entered them at that moment in that time. And rather than feel anger towards them, or rather than have our ego be hurt for them, maybe we can have compassion and maybe we can help them. I mean, the first people we need to have compassion for is ourselves. And we need to have that compassion, give ourselves a little slack. If the steam blew the lid off our pot, there's always a way back. There's a humility factor. There's apologies that can be made. And the Torah is here to tell us, if you think you're better than Moshe, that never ever make a mistake, then your ego is too big for yourself. The Torah is telling us here, everybody has frailties, everybody is human. Give ourselves, give yourself a break, and move on and move forward. Don't stay in that place. Even if you enter it momentarily, even if you just touch it, even if it's something that you just glimpse at, 
whether it's depression, whether it's anger, whatever it is, move forward to get to the promised land, to get to the next phase in our lives. We have to leave the baggage behind, leave mara, leave me meriva. Yeah, that's what life is about. There's going to be some maras, there's going to be some me merivas along the way. But to get to the next place, to get to the future, God is telling us, let all of that go and find that place inside of you where your godliness resides, where you have strength. I created you with that strength. And when you use words to build up other people, don't forget to use those very same words to build yourself up. If you make a mistake, you're not a bad person. You did a bad thing. It's the first thing that they teach in psychology. If your kid does something wrong, they're not a bad person. They did a bad, they did a bad action. And what's beautiful about it, there's always an antidote. There's always a, a remedy. There's always mayim chayim. God wants us to be constantly sprinkling ourselves with the water of life to recreate ourselves, to regenerate ourselves, and to regenerate those around us so that God willing, we all could find ourselves to the promised land, to Eretz Yisrael, in peace. The rest of the parasha talks about getting rid of all the enemies around us, getting rid of all the people that wish us ill, and puts us literally, the last words of the parasha, they talk about standing at the cusp of the Yarden, and I will leave you with these words because in our parasha, I told you the people also sing, we have song, and one of the songs that I'd like to reference so we end on a high note is in Parashat Ha'azinu, in the book of Devarim, chapter 32, verse 19, speaks of this word, ka'as. And it says about ka'as, Hashem will see and will be provoked by the anger of his sons and daughters. And he will say, I shall hide my face from them and see what their end would be because they're a generation of reversals, children whose upbringing is not in them. They provoked me with a non-God, angered me with their vanities. And what God is saying here is for the people who don't believe in him, there is this uh, idea of having his face hidden from them. But for the people who do believe in him, for the people who do believe that the spirit that they uh, embody is holiness, God's not going to hide his face from them. God's going to show his greatness and his glory and allow for our inner lights to shine. And with this, I hope and I pray that we don't just conquer our enemies like we did in this parasha, but we conquer our psychological enemies the ones that can sometimes do us more harm than the external physical ones. So it's time that we love ourselves, we give ourselves a break, we all make mistakes and we gotta move on and we have to move forward from them because that's the only place for us to find our best selves. So with that, um, if anybody has anything that they'd like to say, um, you can feel comfortable to unmute yourselves Let me just see here. Um, Great class, as always. Thank Great you. Great class, Vivian. I have a question. I have a question. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Yes. Great class. Great. Thank you. Great. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that when he took it, Hamate, the letter He, I feel like that's the special Mate. So. so the commentaries agree with you. They say that he actually was supposed to take a Haron's Mater because God knew already that Moshe was furious and fuming. So he wanted him to take the Mater of a Haron, which represents peace and represents peace between man and his so people. So to give Moshe an opportunity to access within himself a place. Look, it's all a choice that we make. And we get to choose how we want to respond to any situation. And God, the commentary say, was sort of hinting to him, 
take the avenue of peace. Take the staff of Aharon. Be Ohev Shalom. Be Rof Dev Shalom. Again, this is not to speak about Moshe. I think it's written for all of us. We're going to approach a situation where we're being attacked and we have a choice to approach it with in a peaceful way of making peace and restoring peace or letting the anger anger get the best of us so thank you for that so i just one more one more question do you think that moshe i mean what what it said in the torah every time he he did he hit it did he did he hit the water he hit the rock yes and they say he hit it twice water with, uh, with Did he oh, so that's another question. It's interesting that you should say that because when they teach about anger, Pado is one of the main uh, characters that comes to play. They say had Pado taken check of his anger, he may have thought through the situation and actually let them go for three days or whatever it is. Your question is whether or not Moshe used that staff to hit to the hit. water. And uh, we say that he himself didn't, that Aharon did, because the water had saved his life. Uh, Do you remember that whole story? Well, and he didn't want to... What? It also saved Moshe's life. No, it, it saved, we're speaking of Moshe, since it saved yeah. his life, he didn't want to turn it to blood. The water was a place of life for Moshe, so how could Moshe turn the turn waters to a place it. of death? So we say that it was Aharon. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Vivian, what about the fact that the people took no responsibility for manifesting any kind of empathy? He just lost his sister. So where is, you know, it's like Moshe has to take the full responsibility. What about the fact that when we pay a shiva call, we have to show the empathy to you the make person. A beautiful who point. Gail, I love the point that you make, and I think I love it. It's, it's really here to enforce that when we're down, when we're depressed, when we're weak, we're most vulnerable to allow for the anger to get the best of us. Meaning, we need to be aware and in touch with ourselves. If we're stressed, if we're overtired, if we've overextended ourselves, says the Torah, that's when the anger has its greatest strength to control us. So either know yourself, get six to eight or 10 hours of sleep, whatever it is that you need. Never allow your tank to be so low that when anger comes at you, you don't have any defenses to fight it. That's a great point. Thank you, Yashikoa. Thank you. Who is that, Felicia? It's Elise Belli. It's Elise Belli. Oh, hi, Elise. Yes, first, what's doing? First, that was an incredible, amazing class. I can't really tell you was. how much it I really was happy. Totally. So much information. I hate to add anything because it was really a perfect class, but if anybody's still listening, I heard from another class a few years ago that I loved on this parasha that was like, I could just add a little bit to it. But what was the real, you know, shame of Moshe Rabbeinu hitting the rock? And they said it was this potential that he had for this big kibush Hashem that he missed. What was, you can ask yourself, what, what was Moshe supposed to say to the rock? Give water? That doesn't make sense. So he said, what was he supposed to do? It was supposed to be the best, most ultimate thing that he could do, which was to speak to the Ra, Bereshit, Bara Elohim, and teach the, a rock, an animate object, Torah, and the rock would give him water. Water Elise, is I, I love what you're saying. You know, Aviva Zornberg, she writes exactly what you're saying here. He said that what affects the psyche more is had they heard rather than seen, right? Yeah. Had they heard Moshe's voice, that would have resonated for many more generations. What you hear with your ears, you are able to retain more than what you see with your eyes. What you see with your eyes is more finite than what you hear with your ears. And what you're saying is they could have literally heard with their ears that our mouths and our speech 
is a form of creating. Thank you, Elise. I, I like that very much. I, I, I believe um, that that's a very strong point. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian, for your pearls of wisdom, as always. I love it. you. I'm coming Thank to the you. Grand Canyon. Thank with you, me. Vivian. <laughs> Thank you. I'd love to go back. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you, for doing Thank it. you, Vivian. Have a beautiful, beautiful day. A class too, above Annette. and beyond. Thank you. Thank Be you. Be happy. Oh, wow.